Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I share my recent HRCI, Alchemizing HR, webinar titled, Enacting Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for the Future of Good day, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Alchemizing HR, Navigating What's Next. Today's topic is enacting diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for the future of work. My name is Clarissa Peterson, and I'm thrilled to be with you today. I am your host and facilitator. I'm also the former chair of the board of HRCI, and I proudly hold the SPHR, the GPHR, and the Leading Professional in Ethics and Compliance Certifications. I've been a Global Chief HR Officer for many years, and currently I run an organization called Ohana HR, and our firm works with organizations that are going through change and transition to help them on their journey and also providing executive coaching and support to their leaders. So without further ado, let me introduce you to today's speaker. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Jonathan Westover, PhD. John is the Chair Professor of Organizational Leadership, the Academic Director at the Center for Social Impact, the Managing Partner and Principal of Utah Valley University and Human Capital Innovations. John has been a Professor and Chair of Organizational Leadership in the Woodbury School of Business at Utah Valley University, academic director of the UVU Center for Social Impact, and the UVU Sim Lab and faculty fellow for ethics in public life. He's also in the Center for the Study of Ethics. He's been published widely in academic journals, books, and he's a practitioner of many, many publications. John's a regular visiting faculty member in other international graduate business programs as well. He's experienced in organizational leadership, people management, and organizational development. Dr. Westover received his Bachelor of Science degree in sociology research and analysis with minors in management and Korean from the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, and his Master of Public Administration degree with an emphasis in organizational behavior and human resources management from the Marriott School at Brigham Young University. He received his PhD in sociology with an emphasis in international political economy and work in organizations from the College of Social and Behavioral Science at the University of Utah. And he has also received graduate certificates in demography and higher education teaching from the University of Utah. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Jonathan Westover. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. Uh, the The invitation uh, was was very welcome uh, when when I first made connection a couple of months ago to to start setting up for this webinar. Um, I also should say uh, I don't. I apologize first and foremost for having such a long bio, and I appreciate all of your indulgence as, as that was read. Um, one thing that wasn't included, though, which uh, I, I'm very proud of, is that I was a board. I'm a prior board member of HRCI, um, and it was a wonderful experience being involved with the board. And I continue to serve on the CEO uh, advisory council and working with Amy Dufresne. A wonderful organization. Uh, I love HRCI, and it's really my privilege to have the opportunity uh, to be with all of you today and to share some of my thoughts uh, along this topic. So as we jump on in, uh, first, I, I do want to say I welcome any question. Uh, 
And I, I recognize we probably won't be able to get to all of the questions today. So here on this title slide, you can see my email. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any uh, follow-up questions or if you just want to make connection. I'll also share at the end of the presentation a slide that has my LinkedIn uh, information on it. And I would love to connect with any or all of you on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I, I probably am connected with many of you on LinkedIn already, uh, but I would... Uh, consider that an honor to have the opportunity to, con to connect and continue the conversation. So please don't uh, be shy about reaching out to me and we can uh, have a nice dialogue. Uh, today, we only have you know, so much time to be able to get into such an, uh, a, an important topic and something that has so much depth to it. So I'll be talking today about enacting diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, and belonging for the future of work. And I want to start by framing uh, really what I see is the, the disruptive mechanisms that are influencing the future of work. And then that is the foundation uh, by which we'll then discuss this idea of enacting diversity, equity, inclusion um, moving forward. First, I, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, many of the ideas that we're going to be discussing together today uh, come from my recent uh, book that was published in the fall, the Acme of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Uh, there's only, again, so much time that we will have uh, together today. I do invite you, though, to check this out. Uh, it is part of the uh, Kindle Unlimited uh, plan. So if you are subscribed to that, you can get free access to this book. And I would love um, to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, I chose, in, in thinking about the title for this book and trying to think about this, those skills, those competencies, those capabilities necessary for the future of work and necessary for a truly exceptional and remarkable leadership moving into the future, uh, some of those core elements surround this inclusion um, focus that we'll be really talking about today. And I chose the word alchemy for a very specific reason, and it's probably very similar to the reason why Alchemy was chosen uh, for this webinar series as part of the title. Uh, as I think about Alchemy, it, it, it was that, that medieval forerunner of chemistry, this mixture of the speculative, of speculative philosophy, um, the arts, the physical sciences, prior to the, the chemistry being able to uh, change objects uh, in the way that it, we can today, many individuals uh, tried to take existing precious objects and change them into something even more precious. And in many cases, for example, in the Middle Ages, it was it was gold. They were trying to change things into other objects into gold uh, through some sort of formula. Now, we know today that you can't just magically change things into gold, but this idea behind this kind of interdisciplinary approach that we can take towards identifying our own personal kind of secret sauce around our leadership, the alchemy of our own individual leadership approach, I think is a powerful idea that we can take who we are, our innate capacities and capabilities, um, our innate value that we have as individuals, and we can build on that. We can grow into something more. We can become that truly remarkable leader. And so one of the things that, that I try to do in the book is, is provide a, a, a mechanism for people to practice self-reflection as they go through and as we explore these different leadership topics, ultimately with the, with the, the end goal of helping individuals uh, set goals, self-reflect, self set goals, and ultimately grow into their own capacities and capabilities. That's really what I'm striving for and, and what I hope we all can get at um, in our interactions today in this session and in continuing interactions uh, as we uh, connect in the future. So let's start now with this laying of the foundation of the future of work. We know that things have been shifting dramatically, uh, and, and this isn't new. Uh, many frame this as we're in the middle of the fourth wave of the Industrial Revolution or Industrial Revolution 4.0. Going all the way back to the cotton gin and some of these, these mechanical devices that were created uh, at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, since the, since the beginning, we've been consistently disrupting labor 
with these different technologies. And as time has gone on, we've gone through these different waves of the Industrial Revolution. And over the last 50 years, we've continued to see this process at play. And robotics come online uh, with with the uh, the advent of the the personal computer and and then the internet and personal handheld devices we and and the the decline in computing cost and the exponential increase in storage uh, ability you know we, we just see this continual exponential growth in the technological capacities um, that we now have to carry out much of the work that human beings did in the past but again this isn't new we, we've seen this at every step of the way. There's always been disruptions and new technologies that have displaced certain workers um, and certain types of tasks and certain types of jobs, but have simultaneously created many new opportunities that previously nobody had even conceived of. And that's currently what's happening. So as we consider existing um, disruptive technologies, uh, among, you know, some of which are, you know, we've talked at nauseum, I'm sure you've talked at nauseum about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, we can't understate the role that these technologies and many others will have in disrupting global labor markets. Uh, that's the reality we're in. And, you know, Many individuals will bemoan that fact and, and, you know, perhaps there are, there are larger scale societal discussions that need to happen around, um, uh, these disruptive technologies and this displacement of workers and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm, it's not really my goal to get into any of that today, other than to just recognize that that's the reality we're in. And this, this yet last year of the pandemic, has only accelerated and acted as a catalyst to to move us more quickly into this future of work. This this future that was already coming our way. We'd already seen uh, we we're, we're, we were already going on that trajectory, um, and now we're just getting there faster. As as so many organizations had to flip on a dime and just almost immediately move to virtual work uh, and struggle and wrestle with how to integrate these, these existing technologies and leverage them in order to carry out the functions, the core functions of their business so that they can reach their customers and ultimately add value to the marketplace. So as we look back, say the last 50 years um, at the nature of work and how it's slowly over time shifted, that doesn't provide us with a crystal ball about what things will look like in the future, but it does give us clues and we can look at trajectories and patterns that have influenced the last 50 years. Uh, we can see what's happened in this acceleration period over the last year of the pandemic. And that gives us a pretty decent idea of what we might expect to see in the coming five years, the coming decade or, or decades. And ultimately, I believe that everything points to uh, the requirement for us to develop more transferable skills that we'll talk about here in a moment that will allow us to be ready, not just for the demands of today's labor market and the jobs of today uh, and to be effective HR professionals within this current environment, but will allow us to adapt um, and to adopt these technologies and be prepared for a future of work that will inevitably have entire new occupations and new jobs and new types of tasks and, and behaviors that we do at work that we currently can't even conceive of, that we have no idea what they even um, consist of currently. As one simple example of this, I just think of the rise of the internet and of social media just over the last decade and a half. Now, if you would have asked anyone about who wanted to be a social media marketer 15 years ago, uh, everyone would look, look at you with a blank stare because that the whole concept of that didn't even exist. Social media itself barely existed at that point in time. Um, but now it's, it's a huge industry. It's a huge um, job uh, in, in occupational category that so many people uh, fill in. And, and we could, we could point out many, many other examples. The reality is there will be many more of those that emerge in the coming decades. So what are we doing as organizational leaders? What are we doing as HR professionals within our organizations to prepare our organizations for the needed skill sets for the future of work? And how are we leading out 
those initiatives. That's that's the kind of framing and the foundation that I want to for for us to really think about as we jump in today. In this slide, you see um, this is adapted from the Institute for the Future, um, the the Future Work Skills Report of 2020 and 2021. In the outer ring, you see these meta drivers of change uh, that are shifting the nature and the future of, of the workplace. Uh, starting with an increasingly computational world, super structured organizations, mega conglomerates, global powers. Um, when we talk about political hegemonies around the world, we also have these, these um, corporate hegemonies that are emerging. And there's a lot of conversations we need to have as societies in thinking about what that means uh, for the role of the citizenry, what that means for employees, what that means for the, the employee experience in the workplace. Where we ha we see an increasingly interconnected, globalized world um, that's never been more apparent than it is right now, as virtually all geographic barriers have been broken down due to this pandemic, and people are just forced to work completely virtually with each other. Uh, and so now, like I don't know about where all of you are joining this webinar from. I'm sitting in the corner of my bedroom at home. Uh, I only live a mile away from my university campus. Uh, and I go into campus sometimes, but predominantly I work from home. My wife also is working from home. I have six children doing school from home, ages seven to 17. It's a struggle. Everyone's experiencing it, right? Um, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, but because of the technology, we're able to connect with people from across the globe. I've always done a lot of international collaborations. I've always, um, flown to other parts of the world for consulting work or to do collaborative research projects. Um, but I've never done more consistent, regular uh, international collaborations than I have this past year during the pandemic, uh, simply because everyone's now much more comfortable with these virtual technologies. And it's just super easy to suggest, hey, let's jump on a call and you jump on a Zoom meeting or a, t a Microsoft Teams meeting or whatever. And all of a sudden you're having this live interaction. Whereas previously, you know, I might have jumped on a plane, you know, spent a week flying out to Europe and, and spending a couple of days with colleagues and then flying back. I, I can do all of that, but much more efficiently by jumping, you know, online. Now that's not just, I, I need to acknowledge that we have lost something in that process of this international global connectivity through virtual means. Uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to advocate for, you know, getting rid of face-to-face -face interactions or, or, and I love travel. So I, I hope that we get back to a point where we can, where I can travel again. But my point is, that we, there's no geographic barriers to how we can interact with each other. This has a lot of implications for, for the nature of work, how we lead, not just in terms of virtual teams generically, but specifically cross-cultural, international um, virtual teams. And that has a lot of implications for what we'll continue to talk about today in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and how we can lead out those initiatives within our organizations. There's new media ecologies, the rise of smart machines and systems, extreme longevity and shifting demographic trends globally, inverted population pyramids, and more and more, you know, people living longer and, and younger generations that are going to have to carry a heavier burden of caring for the, the older population. Um, and there's just so much we, we could unpack here. I don't want to dive into this too much because of, for lack of time, but uh, suffice it to say that the world is changing. It will continue to change. The nature of work will continue to change. And as the nature of profession, we need to be ready for that change. If we're just trying to be reactive, um, then then we're going to miss the boat. So so we need to prepare now uh, for these changes that are currently in process, recognizing that over the next five to 10 plus years, we're going to see dramatic shifts that will continue uh, the, the tr current trajectories that we're on. Because of all this change that's happening in the center of this diagram, you see some of those, those skills, those transferable skills that are going to be needed in many types of roles and positions within organizations. Cognitive load management, virtual collaborative skills, new media literacy, design mindset, transdisciplinarity, the ability for people to, to get out of their silos and connect with others from different backgrounds and different areas of expertise, sense-making, novel adaptive thinking, and then what will be the focus for the rest of our time together, um, cross-cultural competence. So if I'm trying as an organizational leader to lead out DE&I um, efforts and, 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 and drive towards belonging, 
uh, a sense and a culture of belonging for my uh, employees and having a safe environment, uh, it starts for me with this kind of a framing. Uh, and, and at the very foundation of it is the connection between leadership and service. I am a full um, believer in servant leadership uh, as a leadership approach and practice. Um, of course, there are many uh, different leadership theories. There are many different leadership paradigms and approaches, and many can have success in different ways. Uh, I, I, to date, as both a practitioner, a scholar, and a professor, I have seen no um, model or theory of leadership that leads to better, more consistent, positive outcomes than when an individual can adopt a leadership and service, a servant leadership mindset, and recognizing that they are not above their people, but they work alongside their people. And in fact, it's the true leader who who is willing to roll up their sleeves, work alongside their people and work to develop their people. That requires us to be vulnerable. That requires us to be self-reflective. And ultimately it's only as we have a clear understanding of self uh, and we develop that self-knowledge and understanding that we'll have the capacity to better truly uh, understand those that we lead and serve. We all have all of our own garbage, right? We all have our baggage and our biases and our prejudices. Um, and when we interact with other people, unless we recognize that in, in ourselves first, we can't start to set it aside. Unless we have an awareness of our implicit biases, we can't start to try to set those aside so that we're not just projecting all of our crap onto everyone else every time we have an interaction. Uh, and that's honestly what a lot of managers and leaders do in organizations. Uh, they're, they're just projecting their own framing, their own understanding and thinking onto those they serve rather than trying to empathize with them and really listen and understand to them, uh, understand them so that they can better lead and serve them. So as we understand ourselves better, we understand others better. And it's a reciprocal process that has to be there. Uh, and as we do that, then we can start to continually develop our leadership skills, abilities, our competencies and capabilities, and then apply those skills and abilities uh, on a regular basis. That then creates feedback loops where we can continue to learn more about ourselves and others. That's a continual process that never ends. That's a lifelong journey. And if we can adapt, if we can adopt that kind of a, uh, a leadership and intellectual humility, um, to our approach to leading initiatives, programs, people, uh, and organizations, then I think we're going to be in much better shape as we move into focusing on these diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives within the organization. Along with that, there are a couple proverbs that I wanted to share with you today. Um, as was mentioned in my bio, uh, I had, I lived for, I've lived actually in many Asian countries for a good amount of my adult life. Um, and for about two and a half years, I lived in South Korea. During that time, I learned the language. Uh, I continued to study the language after I returned back to school. And uh, I had uh, an opportunity to be there in, in various roles. And, and the second time I returned to, to South Korea, I had the opportunity to work in the corporate organizational development office at LG Electronics. Um, along these experiences, I learned a lot about the culture, a lot about the language, of course. And there's all these, these idioms these, uh, what they call sokdams, um, these proverbs. And one of them that I learned very early on that's always stuck with me is this idea of, uh, that, well, the proverb in Korean is chulam jie, which literally means bluer than indigo. Now, if you imagine indigo as a color, uh, it, it, it's not a word we often use. It's not a color we often use to describe things, um, but it, it is a truly remarkable, vibrant blue, the bluest of blues. And so a Korean person who's describing someone who's bluer than indigo, they're, they're doing that in reference to um, Korean culture and many Asian cultures, the deference they give to authority, the deference they give to, um, to the elderly, uh, to those who are teachers and leaders. A leader in their mind is someone, a leader or a teacher is someone who at the very core of what they're doing, they're trying to develop their pupils their people to become bluer than indigo or better than themselves, uh, greater than themselves. So I can look to my, my, um, my teacher and say, you are indigo. You are my example. You are the person I want to become. Their goal is not just to get your adoration. 
and to, to think they're wonderful. Their goal is to develop you as their pupil into someone who vastly surpasses them in their own capabilities and capacities. That is a servant leadership mindset. That is one that's focused on the value of your people and helping them to accomplish and achieve their own personal potential. That's what true leadership is in my mind. Another proverb that I wanted to share very quickly is uh, this idea of frog in a well. Umul ane gegori. Literally, a frog at the bottom of a well. Now, now imagine for a moment that you're that frog. You're at the bottom of a well. What are the conditions like down there? You look up. You're at, it's this deep well. You look up. There's a little narrow uh, snippet of sky above you. All you can see of the sky and the outside world is that little pillar of light. At the bottom of a well, it's cold, it's dark, uh, it's wet. Uh, there's probably not a lot to do down there. Uh, you, your, your existence is very limited. On the other hand, it's probably pretty darn safe. There's probably not um, other creatures trying to hunt you down there. Uh, you probably have what you need to survive and, and you're safe. We are all like frogs at the bottom of a well. We all grow up in our own individual little wells that are made up of our, you know, our, our cultural, our social, cultural family dynamics, the values that were taught as children. And that creates the framing of our world. If I'm born at the bottom of a well, the only world that I know, the only way that I can conceive of the world is from the context of that well, because that's all I've ever experienced. But what happens is over time, as we experience new things, as we meet new people, as we experience difference, as we learn about the world around us, we're kind of climbing out of the well. And we, we start to get towards the top of that well. At the top, once we're at the top of that well, we peek our little frog head out and we look around. And for the first time, we realize the vastness of the landscape around us. We realize the beauties of the sky, the mountains, the rivers, the streams, the, the animal life, everything that's around us, none of which we had any conception of prior to rising up in the well. Frog, you know, uh, continuing the metaphor, frogs tend, or we as people tend to do a few different things once we get to the top of that well. We look around, we peek our little head out, we look around, and we acknowledge and appreciate the beauty of it, but then we get scared, we get nervous. We look around and we see there's other animals that can hunt us um, and, and, and we're in danger. Uh, we look around and we see all of this newness uh, that we've never experienced before and that, that causes us to question, that causes us to wonder, you know, I, I thought I knew with certainty everything about my world and my existence and now for the first time there's all these new things I've never experienced before. That's that that sparks a bit of a existential crisis for a lot of people. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll simply retreat back down into the well. They'll say, well, this is great, but I'm comfortable with certainty. I'm comfortable with with simplicity. I'm comfortable with knowing what's out there. And so I'm going to retreat back down into my well. That's like us retreating back down, regardless of everything that's going on around us, that we um, kind of put our blinders on and we retreat back down into our own personal ideologies, our own personal dogmas, whether that's social, religious, political uh, dogmas or ideologies or whatever. And, and we, we walk around with blinders on. So if, if a Korean person says you're, you're like a frog at the bottom of a well, uh, that's not a compliment. That's, that's uh, something that's said of someone who's really just closed minded and stuck in their ideologies. But there's a couple, a couple other options that oft, also happen once you get to the top of the well. Some individuals will look around and they, they, they get excited by it, right? And they're, they're thinking, wow, look at all these, look at all the landscape. And they, they look around, and they see all these other wells. So theirs wasn't the only well. Hey, there's thousands of wells all over the place with other little frogs peeking their heads out, also experiencing the, the entire world for the first time. And the frog will jump out and, and start to go explore these other wells. And eventually they'll find another well that seems to suit them and, and they'll decide, Hey, I, I, I really want to go into this well. And in essence, what they end up doing is they trade ideology for ideology. They, they trade dogma for dogma and they trade one kind of narrow view of the world for a, a different narrow view of the world. That happens a lot. 
Uh, and when you talk about um, developmental psychology and cognitive development and moral and ethical development of individuals, we, we know that the vast majority of human beings on this planet tend to either be the type of frog that reverts down into their own well, or they trade well for well, and they trade dogma for dogma. We want to get past that, though. And there's a third kind of frog. There's the frog that decides that they're willing to embrace the uncertainty, the messiness, even the danger of this big, messy world that's out there because they they want to experience all that the world has to offer because they want to be able to interact with everyone else. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Now, as I, as I share that with you, I hope that that's sparking some, some of your own thinking along the lines of what can it look like for me personally to embrace a more inclusive mindset uh, in my own personal life with those around me and my interactions with others, but also as a leader, what can I do within my organization to influence uh, others around me to adopt similar types of mindsets? And it, what we need to get to is the point where we are getting beyond the the, the obvious forms of diversity. So here on the left-hand side, you see the diversity wheel. In the center are those fairly obvious, transparent, outward-facing elements of diversity, gender, physical uh, and mental ability, age, race. Uh, we, we could debate that and probably add others. But ultimately, um, those are the things that we talk about, we tend to talk about the most in, in the HR space and then the DE&I space. But there's so much more to it than that, right? If you go into the inner circle, you start to see things of religion, religion and belief, social class, socioeconomic status, ethnic heritage, uh, sex, things like sexual orientation. You're not always going to know those things unless you get to know the individual, the, the, the people that are around you. Um, there might be some cues, uh, social cues that are, are connected with those that help you understand whether or not someone might you know, adopt those approaches, beliefs, um, those orientations, whatever, but ultimately it's harder to get at. And once you get to the outer ring, uh, experience and functional knowledge, including military service, communication style, family status, community relationships, um, so on and so forth, all of those elements, those are things that tremendously add to the cognitive diversity that we experience in the workplace above and beyond, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, and those sorts of things, which are also important. And if we're trying to create and leverage the value of diversity in our workplace, we need to think about it more holistically. We need to think about it more um, as more than just getting, you know, people who look differently around the table. And this gets us over to the right side of the slide in this diagram, this Venn diagram, where we see these interconnections of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity, of course, is just getting those multiple identities represented in the organization in the first place. And I know many organizations, they have to start somewhere because they, they've struggled with this tremendously. And if you, if you look around the room and it's pretty much all white, like middle-aged white guys, you have a diversity problem clearly, and you need to focus on getting more uh, diverse representation and diverse identities at the table. And that's hard work. That's super hard work, but that's not enough. 
we need to go beyond that. We need to go once we get those multiple identities at the table, we need to make sure that we're treating them all fairly and equitably with consistency in, in the redistribution of power and looking at the, the, the organizational and social structures that influence the experience of these individuals in the workplace. If we get a diverse group of people around the table, but they experience organizational you know, injustices and inequities on a regular basis, they're not going to stick around. And it's not actually going to help the organization at all, uh, other than perhaps maybe a little bit of a PR, you know, for our PR spin. So we need to get far beyond even just the diversity and the, and the equity. Those need to be a given. We need to get to the point where it's automatic that, yes, we are a, a, an equal opportunity employer. We're a diverse organization. We value diverse uh, and multiple identities being at the table. We're going to treat everyone consistently, fairly, with dignity and respect. That should be the baseline that we're starting from. Once we get there, though, we need to move beyond that. And we need to get to the point where we're creating a culture of inclusion, where the thoughts, ideas, the perspectives of all individuals matter, where everyone feels genuinely like they are valued in the organization and that they're heard. And in the middle of this Venn diagram, then you see that fourth word. So for a long time, we've been talking about the, the importance of diversity. We've been talking about the importance of inclusion. Um, the DE and I space is all the buzz these days, right? In organizations. And we're trying to figure out how we can do things better while being compliant legally and such. Um, more recently though, we have started to focus beyond diversity, equity, inclusion, and get to the belonging space. And I think this is really what we need to be striving for. Uh, that intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion, where an organ, where you have an organization that engages the full potential of every individual, where organization thrives, views, beliefs, and values are fully integrated, where everyone genuinely feels heard, valued, um, that they have an equal opportunity to contribute, um, that they're needed, they're wanted within the organization where it's a safe place for them to contribute, to even speak up and challenge and speak out against uh, injustices and equities. Um, we need to create organizational climates and organizational environments that are um, belonging cultures. Now that's, that's, that's hard work, but that's, that's what we need to get to. And for the future of work, where we're in inner, inner, increasingly interconnected, globalized world with broke, with geographic barriers broken down, more virtual work. Um, one of those core foundational skills that is going to be necessary for any successful leader and really any excess, successful employee in the future to ensure that you're not going to be displaced by a robot or AI or machine learning. One of those core foundational skills is intercultural communication and, and the ability to create this kind of belonging environment where everyone has the opportunity to contribute. This builds on the idea of growth mindset. I'm sure you're all familiar with Carol Dweck's work around growth, growth mindset. Nothing comes easy. Uh, and organizations have to struggle. They have to go through the pain of moving around that circle of diversity, equity, to inclusion, to belonging. Um, if you're not there yet, you can't just snap your fingers, wave a magic wand and get there. You're going to have to have long, hard conversations. You're going to have to get key stakeholders around the table. You're going to have to do the hard work of having um, those conversations, putting in place the policies, practices, procedures that can ensure equity and inclusion, that can break down the systemic barriers, that can uh, eliminate um, the systemic injustices and prejudices that exist in so many organizations. But those difficult roads lead to beautiful destinations, and we are all capable of it. I am a firm believer in growth mindset. We're not stuck in a place of where things were. We can learn, we can grow, we can develop our skills and abilities, and we can help those around us to do the same. And as leaders, we need to model that for our people. If I'm leading an HR department, I need to model growth mindset uh, for everyone on my team and help them to adopt a growth mindset and to start to develop along those lines as well. So ultimately, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? I mean, there's so many key questions that come out of some of what I was presenting today. Uh, I don't want to belabor this point because I want to get to your questions, but ultimately we have to think about the changing nature of work. We have to think about what that means for 
uh, a diverse workforce and for an, inc- an inclusive in a, in a workforce and, and one where we have this culture of belonging. Uh, we have to th- consider how disruptive technologies are going to influence that. Just yesterday, I was interviewing an, inter- an individual who's a CEO of a corporate mobility platform in the UK. Um, their whole goal is to help connect organizations to the global labor force and deal with all the, the messy, sticky compliance issues uh, of employing people from around the world. Uh, we all know how, how difficult that can be. Um, one of the points of our conversation, and as I was interviewing him, uh, that I think was really key, is that because of the ability for us to connect virtually, it only increases our opportunity towards diversive uh, diversified hiring practices, getting good talent from anywhere around the world. Uh, if, if you live in a place that's not particularly diverse, I, I live in Utah. You know, Utah's not known as the most um, racially and ethnically diverse place in the world. Um, but you know what? We're not limited by geographic boundaries. We can seek out global international teams. We also talked in, in my interview yesterday uh, about expatriate workers. And we all know how expensive it is to send expat workers overseas. And uh, disproportionately, those tend to be white men. Uh, The research is clear about that. And we also know from the research that uh, executive ranks in organizations often are filled. So the pipeline for executive ranks are often filled by people who have gone on these expat assignments. So if they're disproportionately, you know, white men, that, that creates a pipeline uh, to have executives that are going to be disproportionately white men. And that's a system that we need to disrupt. Now, can we, just as one example, can we um, utilize technology in a way to give more women, for example, or women of color, for example, opportunities to have these diverse global leadership experiences um, while still providing uh, accommodations and flexibility for people uh, who may need to balance home and work life a little bit more. Uh, these are all the types of questions we need to be asking ourselves. And there's so many implications for the de and space. space. Um, I'm, I'm going on too long. I want to leave time for your questions. So I'll leave it there. Um, again, my email, john.westover at gmail.com. If you don't get a chance to ask your question today, please reach out to me. I'm happy to, to connect with you offline. Uh, I also, as we take questions today, um, just as an FYI, uh, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I already mentioned my book, which uh, which I'd, I'd love for you to check out. I also run my own podcast, the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, which is, which is, of course, completely free. We've published, I don't know, 430 plus episodes where we talk about these sorts of topics every day. Uh, we also put out a magazine uh, that's also digital and completely free. So um, as we go through our Q&A process today, I'd love for you to, to also consider checking out some of these free resources. Uh, with that, uh, Clarissa, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Well, thank you so much, John. Incredible food for thought. And I can't wait to ask you so many questions that have popped up in the chat and certainly in the Q&A. But before I begin, I want to acknowledge that there's over 3,900 people on the call today. Thank you so much for being with us. Of course, we have HR professionals from all over the U.S., but we also have people from all over the world who got up early or are staying up late to be with us. So I want to acknowledge them as well. So we have uh, visitors from Kuwait, from St. Lucia, from Armenia, Canada, Nigeria, Ghana, India, Iraq, Spain, Jordan, Germany, Egypt, Abu Dhabi, the UK, Sierra Leone, and the Cayman Islands. Ah, Kenya just popped up. If I forgot anybody, my apologies, but we're thrilled that you're here with us. So John, let's start back to your book. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. So as we are all here, because we want to really understand how to enact, enable, create diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging in our organizations, give us a couple of leadership behaviors that are necessary to make that happen. Yeah, great question. Um, One of the things that I outline in the book uh, that I think might be worth uh, discussing a little bit is is creating a safe environment and a speak up culture as a leader. That's in my mind. That's one of the first things that I need to be able to do with my team. 
Um, if I want a true uh, place of belonging where everyone, regardless of background, you know, socioeconomic status, race, gender, ethnicity, whatever, um, everyone needs to feel safe. They need to feel the opportunity to contribute. And there's a lot of things I can do to disrupt that and to, to, uh, to get us off track. Um, I, I think of, of meetings, for example. Uh, we know that so many meetings are completely uh, a waste of time. Uh, so many meetings don't leverage. Not this the, one, ladies and gentlemen, other meetings. Uh, ho- hopefully not this one. But, yeah. you know, so many meetings are really, truly a waste of time. Um, and we've all been there. We've all been in those meetings. And part of the reason for that is because many meetings, the way they're organized, the way they're facilitated, um, they don't allow for a safe environment where everyone can can speak up. Uh, And so what you end up having are kind of the louder people, the the extroverts, um, who who tend to, to take the majority of the time. As one simple point, if I'm looking for an inclusive and belonging culture within my organization, I have to create an environment within meetings where we all end up spending more time than we'd probably prefer, um, where everyone has a chance to have a voice and to be heard, where I can facilitate the interactions so that if someone gets stepped over or you have the all too common situation where a woman says something and then everyone kind of ignores it. And then like two minutes later, a man says the same thing. And then everyone like says, oh, that's a great idea. Pat him on the back. We all know that happens all the time. So it's the role of the leader, the facilitator of that meeting to call that stuff out, to set the ground rules, to set the expectations and, and to be able to coach and mentor their people to be able to interact more productively. And I, I'm not saying, you know, sometimes you might actually want to literally call it out in the meeting, uh, you know, that kind of a sexist behavior. Other times you might want to pull someone aside after the meeting and have a, a coaching conversation with them and help them understand like why that was disruptive and why that actually wasn't helpful. Um, there, there's different approaches on how to deal with that. But I would say that's just one example of what we need to do. If you can't create a safe environment, uh, then you can have all, you can have all of this difference represented around the table. You can have a, a, a really nice slate of diversity and it's not going to mean anything. Um, so first and foremost, safety, psychological safety. Uh, there's a lot of questions about will, uh, participants get a copy of your deck and John is very kindly offered to share it. So everyone who is participating today will get a copy of this deck. John, one of the things about the the graphic that you put up and there were so many questions and comments saying, I really need that graphic. I need to show it to my leadership. One of the things that was really powerful about it is that you took the time to define what these terms mean. Language is important in doing this work. One definition that sometimes gets confused is the word equity and equality. So what's the difference between something that's equitable and something that's equal? And are they the same? I mean, I suppose they could be the same, um, but they're usually not the same. Uh, And you've all probably seen some of these um, illustrations. Uh, The illustrations aren't perfect, um, but where you have like, children standing on boxes looking over the fence uh, Mm -hmm. with the baseball field. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, not perfect. Uh, We could critique those, those depictions, but the general premise of it, I think is a good one. And that is equality means that you're literally going to give everyone the same, right? Um, The problem with equality is that people start at different places. And if someone comes from a disadvantaged um, situation or, or, you know, we look at the structural, um, uh, the, the system, the systemic and structural racism, for example, that exists in our society. And that frankly perpetuates itself into many of the policies, practices, and procedures in many organizations. Not, not saying it's on purpose, but it, it's, it's legacy of existing systems that we have to proactively work to dismantle. And if we're not proactively working to dismantle them, they will persist. And so when, if we can acknowledge that those inequity, that those, um, those, those systems exist that lead to inequities, uh, what we need to realize then is that it's not enough to just give everyone the same. We have to support those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So essentially getting everyone back up to, to the same starting point. Uh, another metaphor is, you know, some people, um, 
start at third base. Like they're, they're born with priv- all sorts of, we, we all have privilege. I'm a middle-aged white, straight, cisgendered guy. So I have all sorts of privilege. Um, and I acknowledge that. I started at a place that was different than a lot of people who had disadvantaged past for a variety of reasons. Um, I didn't come from a, like a wealthy families. So I wouldn't say I started on third base, but you know, I started somewhere along the base path, right? Some people do really start at like third base though. And because of where they start, you know, it's so much easier for them to make that final stretch. And then everyone applauds them for everything they've accomplished. Well, what about that person who's standing at home plate and they don't even have a bat in their hand? They're standing at home plate with like a toothpick, right? Figuratively speaking, there are many in our society, many within our organizations that find themselves in that situation. So how do we equal the 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 um, and level the playing field? That's the question so that we can have someone competing with someone else from third base, you know, third base to third base rather than home plate with a toothpick and someone, you know, running home from two feet away from home, you know, home base coming from third base. Uh, you know, those are a couple perhaps silly kind of illustrations and examples. Uh, but the bottom line is we as HR professionals, we as leaders within organizations, we have to be willing to have the hard conversations. We have to acknowledge the systemic uh, and uh, the, the systemic injustices that have plagued um, much of our societies for a really long time and continue to exist in our organizations. Even the most progressive organizations tend to still have remnants of these systems in place that need to be dismantled. So we need, we need to be willing to have those long, hard conversations. I appreciate the use of the word dismantle because we know systemic racism hides in plain sight sometimes in our policies and procedures, because that's how we've always done it, but we haven't taken enough time to look at the it and really examine it. So we have a question, John, how do you measure the impact or effectiveness of inclusion efforts? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, And that's a really, really hard one to answer. Uh, the, The reality is measuring impact of anything is really, really tough. Uh, so the first thing, if again, wh- whether we're talking about inclusion or, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, the issue may be, measuring impact is really hard. And it always has to start with, um, with really specifying, clarifying the desired objectives of what you're trying to achieve. If you don't have that as a starting point, there, you have zero chance of being able to measure impact um, because you don't, you don't even know what you're trying to get at. Uh, so, so understanding that if we're, if we're looking at inclusion and belonging and we want to enhance our, our our inclusion efforts within our organization, the first thing we need to do is have the hard conversations with, with a diverse set of stakeholders, um, allowing everyone to contribute and to, to share their voice, uh, particularly those from marginalized or disadvantaged populations who might be in the organization. We need all of them around the table to be able to talk about what are the issues we're facing? What are the challenges? Where are the gaps? Where, what are the biggest problems? Uh, name it, acknowledge it, put it down on paper, get everyone to recognize that this, yes, this exists. And there, from there, you can actually start to, to identify objectives. What do you want to accomplish in the short term, in the next six months to a year, and, and you know, in the next three to five years, in the next 10 years? And once you do that, you can start to, to identify goals and metrics that go along with each of those objectives. Uh, and then you have to do the hard work of tracking and measuring things over time and doing it in a consistent and sustainable way. And we know that's also hard that requires us to continue to f- put our focus and attention on those issues. It's not, I, I can't, as well-meaning as I may be, if I go in as an organizational leader or, or an HR professional and say, hey, we got to do this and we get everyone around the table and we have the conversation and we put together a really nice strategic plan and a, a really nice inclusion plan with all these points and objectives and all these things we want to measure over time. And then we walk away. Well, guess what? Nothing's going to happen. Uh, so you have to have consistent, sustainable energy uh, and attention given towards it over in the long run, like over years and years and years. And if you're not willing to do that, the reality is you're never going to be able to measure the impact of what you're trying to accomplish. It's a fool's errand because it's just not going to happen. But if you can get commitment from leadership from the top down, 
all the way through middle management um, and, and get the input and buy-in from everybody that this is, this is a, a foundational organizational value what it means for us to, 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 uh, as an institution, as an organization, to have a positive employee experience, we need to be committed and devoted to inclusion and belonging, not just in name only, not just for PR, you know, to put on the website and put nice words up on the wall, but to actually do it, get the commitment that people are going to do it long term. Then you can devise an assessment plan and a sustainability plan, uh, to carry it out. Now, there, there, I mean, there's really no one size fits all though. So there, I can't really just say how, what, what are the objectives? What are the, what, how do you measure that impact? It's going to depend on your organization. It's going to depend on the team that you have in place. Uh, and ultimately though, we can build towards impact assessment uh, if we start to do that legwork and it is worth the time and the energy. Uh, I, I, I feel fortunate to be part of a university. I'm a professor at the local university here at Utah Valley University, um, where we've been committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, not just in name only, but like truly committed to it for over a decade. And we have a, an incredibly robust diversity and inclusion plan with about 75 different action items and metrics that we track, divisions track across campus. Um, that we've done over time for a decade. And we have an inclusion committee that is made up of a diverse set of stakeholders across campus. And it's hard work. Like there's just no substitute for it though. If you want to move the needle, you, you have to put in that time and that effort over a sustained period. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I think we have time for one more question, and I know people are going to be disappointed, but John, if you could make time for us, we'd love for you to come back again and share more of your wisdom. A question here is, when a white male executive or many in a group start to feel awkward or uncomfortable when a non-white female is presenting ideas in a meeting, is there a strategy for the uncomfortable person to notice their emotion or physically logical reaction and and that and how to turn that maybe into an open dialogue or is this a conversation that's happening internally so does do you call them out um, to your earlier comment is their energy impacting you and you call them out or how do you handle that if you are you're feeding off of this negative energy that's sort of disrupting your message that is such a good question and such a difficult situation um and just like anything, maybe it's a cop-out answer, but I, I would say it just totally depends on the situation. Um, you know, I, I think there are absolutely times where it's completely appropriate to call it out. Now, the reality is, if, if say, I'm the woman of color in that situation, if I'm the one that has to call it out, you know, it's pro nothing's going to happen probably, right? Uh, and, and so that's why we need allies within our teams, who, who, so if I'm in that meeting, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the straight white dude in the meeting and I notice this happening, I need to be willing to challenge my colleagues, right? Uh, I need to be willing to stand up for my uh, woman of color colleague who's presenting, who's, who's dealing with this. And if I'm not willing to do that, I need to take a good hard look at myself and, and you know, examine you know, where I'm at in terms of my own commitment to inclusion. Uh, if I'm, if I'm the, the, the person who's having those uncomfortable thoughts and I'm wrestling with it, first and foremost, I would say, I, I hope that we can learn to be self-aware enough to recognize our implicit biases, uh, biases and, and proactively try to table them and respond to them. That, that requires, a, an amount of self-work, mm -hmm. uh, that not everyone is willing to do. So, so at, you know, as HR professionals, as leaders, that's one of the things we need to encourage uh, amongst our teams is we need to encourage continual reflection. Uh, we need to encourage people to, to acknowledge their biases. We need to encourage people and create a safe space for them to try to learn through it. Uh, I, I've talked to many white men, for example, who they're well-meaning, but they're so paralyzed with fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. that 
that all they know is they're uncomfortable and they have no idea how to handle it. They have no idea how to do it without putting their foot in their mouth or whatever. And so we need to create a safe space where they can learn and grow as well, right? Um, one thing I'll say, and I, I actually experienced this firsthand a number of years ago. I was in a meeting, maybe five, six years ago. I was in a meeting where it was predominantly, you know, uh, uh, mostly white men. Um, there were, there were some, uh, some difference there, but it was mostly white men. And we were in this meeting and the leader decided it, they needed to bring in a speaker to talk about diversity issues. And they talked about microaggressions and they talked about implicit bias. Unfortunately, what ended up happening is the leader who brought in the speaker ended up speaking up about halfway through the presentation saying, and actually said, I am incredibly uncomfortable. You're making me uncomfortable. I think the way you're approaching this topic is not helpful. And he basically shamed the speaker uh, for having the conversation. That's like the exact opposite <laughs> of what you should. So we could all learn from it by any chance. Oh, I know. No recording, but no. my goodness, it, that was incredibly unfortunate. And it set back our efforts um, with that group of people. So we would have been much better off if we never even had the meeting. Um, it, it didn't move the needle forward at all. It set us backwards. So be, be mindful of that potential. Like if we don't design these experiences as well, then we can cause retrenchment uh, among people who have, um, you know, kind of, you know, the, these negative types of perceptions. Yeah, um, I'm going to land us on that point because we're just about at time. This has been incredibly powerful from all the comments that we're seeing on, on the chat and in the Q&A. So thank you so much for being here with us. I would agree with one of the proverbs you've shared with us. I would say, John Westover, you're bluer than indigo. So thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you. On behalf of all of my HR colleagues from all over the world, we thank you. You have filled our vessels today, and we hope to connect with you again in the future. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.